而家有人预测喺二零二七年，中国嘅习近平会有一个机会支枪打开。一定要咁快，因为我哋已经冇时间再按传统模式慢慢嚟。美国而家面对嘅威胁，我哋全球盟友面对嘅威胁，预测话我哋喺同中国潜在冲突嘅头八日内会用晒弹药。呢啲事实意味住我哋需要极速扩大我哋嘅生产能力。喺一边将当国大政客仲日日喺电视上面打嘴炮、争论不休嘅时候，美国嘅再工业化可能已经静悄悄咁展开咗啦。而领头嘅正正就系国防工业。由 p a m a l u c k y 创立嘅国防科技公司 a n d r o 最近宣布，佢哋将会喺美国俄克俄州哥伦布市附近兴建一个超大嘅军工厂设施，叫做兵工厂一号。p a m a l u c k y 系边个？佢咪就系嗰个十九岁创立 Oculus VR， 然后以二十亿美金卖咗俾 Facebook 嘅天才小子咯。如果你哋未听佢嘅故事而想听嘅话咧，就可以揿呢度右上角嘅链接，睇翻我哋之前一辑三集以 p a m a l u c k y 为主题嘅故事集啦。若果话 Elon Musk 系铁甲奇侠 Tony Stark 嘅灵感来源，咁呢位 p a m a l u c k y 就绝对系新一代嘅中意着夏威夷恤、踢住拖鞋嘅少年铁甲奇侠啦。佢嘅兵工厂一号将会系全球首个全自动化、以人工智能为核心嘅超级工厂，专门研发同制造无人机、自主地面载具、检测器平台等自动化军事装备。对美国嚟讲，兵工厂一号。绝对唔单止系一间工厂咁简单，佢更加系代表住全新嘅国防制造模式，由传统嘅军火工业转型为一个高效率、有商业技术驱动嘅科技军事产业。不过听我讲就不如听下 Pamalucky 自己点样形容呢间兵工厂，佢嘅理念系乜嘢，佢嘅上市计划，同埋点解一期一定要赶喺二零二七年之前完成啦。啊，仲有仲有嘅系。之前试过几次，我觉得都系一半嘅你哋想睇字幕版，一半嘅咧就想听 A I 广东话版嘅。所以咧睇字幕嘅你就继续睇落去。如果想听 Palmer 自己讲广东话嘅咧，咁就要 click 下低我拼咗喺留言嗰度嗰条 link 去 A I 广东话版本啦。It's incredibly aggressive the timeline to manufacture the first phase of this site and then start production mid 2026. How big a factor was that timeline in Ohio's selection, Palmer? It has to be this fast because we don't have time for business as usual. The types of threats, threats that the United States is facing, that our allies around the world are facing, the fact that we are predicted to run out of munitions within the first eight days of a potential conflict with China mean that we need to hyper scale our manufacturing of these types of weapons. But why Ohio?、Systems. Was this the only state that could guarantee that timeline? I think that they were the state that gave us the best shot of hitting that timeline. Look, we've. Really engage well with Jobs Ohio, with a lot of the politicians here,、uh, not just at the state level but the local level. You know, like you said, we're hiring 4,000 people here in direct jobs. A lot more jobs than that in a direct, or sorry, in an indirect capacity. It's the largest single job creation event in Ohio history. It was a state that told us. We have the workforce. We have a million people who are capable of working in this facility within a 45-minute drive. We're willing to work with you on higher education to help train people so that they can come in and they can work with you.、Uh, our customer, in, in the form of the United States, Air Force, United States Air Force, obviously has a huge presence here in the form of Wright Patterson Air Force Base. So really, all the stars align to make Ohio a great place for us to do it and to do it fast. And speaking candidly, as someone who is from California, there's some states that are really good at、uh, pushing you out and slowing you down. Down, and there's others that are great at pulling you in and speeding you up, and that's what Ohio was. Let's go there. Was California at any point a likely candidate? And if not, why? There was a zero percent chance at any point of Arsenal One being located in California. There's a lot of reasons for that. But I mean, you can go through them. It's the high cost of living. It's the very high energy costs. It's in some cases the unreliability of the energy systems.、Uh, it's the unreliability of the state politics and the, the the worry on the regulatory side. And just you know, the reality is California has enough money and enough really successful companies that they don't really have to worry about a company like mine, a company like Anderol.、Uh, the jobs that we are bringing here to Ohio, they are material. And they are something that the state really, really cares about. And it doesn't hurt that one of our co-founders, Trey Stevens, is a NATO-born Ohioan. I, I won't say that's why 
that we made the final decision, but it definitely made sure that Ohio was at the top of the list from the beginning. What you did say as a company is that it had nothing to do with Vice President-elect J.D. Vance, No, but this, that was not a factor. This decision has been going on a lot longer than that. We're finally able to talk about it today. But I mean, you saw the renders, you saw the site, the site plans, uh, things like that take a long time to put together. We raised our $1.5 billion round of financing last year specifically to build this facility. One of the questions from our audience on social media was about the jobs. Yep. 4,000 over 10 years. There must be a mix of those originating from Ohio, but you must also be trying to attract talent out of state to move here. And I know you'll be spending a lot of time here as well. Well, I'm definitely going to be buying a house out here. I'm blessed with financial success from my first company, Oculus VR, that allows me to get a place so I don't have to get a hotel room when I'm spending time out here. Um, the, the thing about... Like, yes, we're going to hire a lot of NATO Ohioans. I think we're also going to have a lot of people who are imports who are coming in and adding to the economy here. You look at our headquarters in California, we're about 80 percent imports. About 80 percent of our employees are coming from outside of the state into California. And I think that we're going to do I think we're going to we're going to bring a lot of people here as well. Maybe not maybe not 80 uh, percent, but there's going to be a lot of people who are moving to the area economically building it up. The supply chain in Ohio is actually very interesting. So you will have use of two runways where we are now, Rickenbacker Airport. That's right. But my understanding is that take, for example, a, a Fury behind us. In some cases, you'll be able literally to take off from the runway, which is just a few feet from where we're sitting, and deliver that technology direct to customer. Explain. Direct to customer or directly to the action? I mean, so this is Fury. This is our, uh, our CCA, Collaborative Combat Aircraft. It's a, basically an autonomous, loyal wingman fighter jet that can fight alongside F-35s and other fighters that the United States and our allies use. But you're right. The, the, the goal here is that we can manufacture these aircraft at scale, thousands of these fighter jets here, and then we can either fly them directly to the customer or, in some cases, directly to the theater. Of course, probably with refueling stops along the way. Uh, but that's, that, that's what we did during World War II, and uh, that's what we plan on doing it again. Ohio is quite busy. Uh, Intel has a fab going up. That's right. Quite nearby. Do you see that as a sort of competition for talent, or do you see it as value add to being here? It's both. There's value added, and of course, I'm probably going to hire some of their people, and they're going to hire some of our people. That's just the way that these things always go. What you want to try to do is cre make the area more attractive in general, right? right? Like, if Andrew was here, and we were the only company that was in the area, uh, it'd be harder to get really, really world-class people to want to stay in the area or move to the area because we're the only game in town. Right. When they know that it's a you know, healthy ecosystem of career choices, it's a lot easier to get people to come, even if you, can manage, if you do manage to keep them around. Palmer, when I spoke to Ohio Governor Mike DeWine earlier, I asked him what was the sort of single biggest factor that gave him conviction about you meeting your timelines not just for manufacturing, but your commitments right. to this state. In my career, with respect, every sort of industrial technology company I've covered, no matter how many billions of dollars they've raised from private uh, sources, venture, private growth equity, have never met their manufacturing timelines. There's always slippage. Granted, the pandemic's been a factor. Yep. He said that that factor was you and your colleagues just from meeting you. You are the point of difference. What can you tell me about how the team guarantees that 2026 timeline? I think that, like I said earlier, we don't have time for business as usual. Right now, people are predicting that there's gonna be a window of opportunity for Xi in China that opens in 2027. That means that you necessarily need to be ready for a potential great power conflict with China in 2027 and it, for at least a few years after that. So we, we have to, right? There's, there's no other option. The whole point here, the reason we lay, raised that $1.5 billion round, the reason that we've been accelerating this process, the reason that we're investing in building this factory ahead of the customer actually paying us to do it is because we believe in that timeline, because we have to believe in it. It is, it is critical that we hit it, and I think we will. Uh, are you getting some financial incentives from the state of Ohio? Absolutely. They, were, they, 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 they gave us a great incentive package, and that was, definitely, that was definitely part of our decision. What's the value, and what does it look like? What is its composition? I am going to let somebody else tackle it because I'm actually, I, I can tell you it's in the hundreds of millions versus the billions that we're going to be putting Intel in. Intel got 2.1 billion. Yeah, I think they did a better job negotiating than me, than, than me maybe. I don't know. Um, but I'm really glad that Intel is here. They're a really, they're a really great partner. Obviously, they're, 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 making, uh, they're making a lot of U.S. semiconductors that are competitive with, uh, competitive with the things that are being done in other countries. And it's critical for our products that we have 
advanced semiconductors that are made in the United States. So I'm really glad that they're down the road from us. Palmer, it's important to have some extended time with you to talk about Arsenal One. I think one of the most common questions I get from the audience, even if they're familiar with Anderil, is what does Anderil actually do? Sure. They might know you as a weapons manufacturer, or if, if they are a bit more researched, uh, autonomous defense systems. Right. But could we just simply talk about what Arsenal One is going to manufacture and where that technology will be sold and deployed? The way we look at ourselves is as a defense product company, not a contractor, but a product company, meaning we take a product company approach. We decide what to build it, how to build it, when it's done, and we invest our own money into making that happen. Then we sell products to the customer. Now, we work hand in hand with customers through that process. It's not like I can go off and build a Batmobile and try to sell it to them because I think it's cool. Uh, but I think that... Uh, I'm sorry, what was the second part of the question? The second part of the question is what specifically so what will specifically are you building? Build? So the things that we're building, they're driven by what our customers need, but we are investing a lot of our own money in them. So obviously we're building Fury, you know, our, our autonomous fighter jets. Behind you, you see all three of the different Barracuda cruise missile family. So the, the Barracuda 100, Barracuda 250, Barracuda 500, autonomous swarming cruise missiles. We're also going to be building a lot of our ISR drones. We're going to be building a lot of our mobile command and control systems here. And we're even going to be building some combat heads-up displays here. I think you're going to be hearing some news about that soon. There is a, a timeline. It doesn't sort of all happen at once. So initially, the first phase of the facility, I think, is about five acres. That's right. It goes up to 500 acres. What does that process look like, building out what you call hyperscale uh, defense or weapons manufacturing? The process is building this place up in a way that only a madman would. Our, our COO, Matt Grimm, has been kind of the hero of the day in figuring out how we're going to go from uh, you know, a very, very minimal footprint today to you know, 90 football fields in a very short period of time. And, uh, it wouldn't be possible if we didn't have really close cooperation with the local authorities on the permitting side, on the power and utilities side, on the on, on the logistics, for example, rail logistics, air logistics, road logistics, being able to move things in and out of this facility very, very quickly. If everybody wasn't on board and moving lockstep together, this timeline would be absolutely unreasonable. And you, you keep hitting it, but I, I will note, we have competitors who are telling us that yes. we are not going to hit these timelines and that we are madmen. And so... Look, you know, anyone could be wrong, but I would love to do a follow-up piece in maybe 24 months and see if we're bad men or not, or if we pull this, okay, if we pull it off. 24 months from now, you and I will sit down again, but in an operational facility is what we're, you're saying. We'll sit down in Arsenal 1 and we'll have fighter jets coming off the line is my prediction. The other big question I get for you direct from the audience is how they as retail investors can participate in this. Well, you, I, well as you know, the United States government has taken a very un-American position in saying that you need to be generally an accredited investor to invest in companies like Andrel. I think that's totally bogus and it's, it's, it's anti-American, especially because the only thing that being an accredited investor means is you have money already. I know a lot of people who have money who you would never say they're accredited to do anything and vice versa. That said, we are on a path to being a publicly traded company. I think that's an important thing. I want us to be accessible to the American public. I think that it's good for people to be able to invest in American defense companies, not for them to just remain private forever. I'm, it's, I'll take an ideological stand there. I think that that is a good thing for the country. It's good for us. It's good for our customer. Uh, as for when that happens, it's hard to say. We don't need to IPO because we, we're doing really well. We, we're winning a lot of contracts. We're making quite a bit of money. Uh, we don't, doubled last year to about a billion. That's the, that's the rumor. That's the rumor. Um, things are doing really, really well. So we don't have to IPO to like raise money to keep the company going. I want to do it at a time when the markets are favorable, when people understand what we're doing. And I also want to prove out some of these big bets. I don't really want to IPO when people are saying that we're madmen and trying to do the impossible. I want to do the impossible and then say, look, we did it. All you have to do is bet we can do it again. You will be doing business with somebody new in the Department of Defense. President-elect Trump's pick is Mr. Hegseth. That's right. You know, uh, he was not one of the names that you had in your head uh, when we last spoke a few months That's ago. That's right. You'd asked me about it, and I said that I knew the names. I, I heard a lot of names coming around, and that I was a big fan of all of them. And you're right. He wasn't one of the names that I had heard rattling around. May I just make a point that, you know, look at his CV. He doesn't have experience running an organization of that size. You want change and improvement in how America does business with the private sector in defense. So what were your approach with potentially Mr. Hegseth be, and what do you make of him? I think that there's a lot of credentialism that is being levied against him that is totally unfair, and I personally empathize with him a lot. 
I started Oculus VR when I was 19 years old, living in a camper trailer and putting myself through school. And I didn't have the experience to be running that company. And I grew it to thousands of people and international business shipping millions of virtual reality headsets all over the world. And I didn't have the experience to be running Android either. I had absolutely no business running this company. People could have made the exact same criticism. What the hell does Palmer know about the military? What the hell does he know about national security? Yeah, his heart's in the right place, but he's just not qualified. The leap from where the people say his credentials are and what he needs to do is a much smaller leap than the best leaps that I've seen people make in my career. So I, I, I'm, I'm never going to be the guy to say, oh, I don't think he's qualified. No, he's way more qualified than I've ever been to do any job that I've ever done. And I'm doing a pretty good job of it. So I, I, I mean, God bless him. I think that he's a great pick. I read his book, The War on Warriors. So I was familiar with him, though not his name being in the arena. I think he's going to kick ass. Palmer, let's end on President-elect Trump, but in the context of Arsenal 1, you still believe change is needed in that military-industrial complex procurement process. Absolutely. What specifically needs to change under the next four, over the next four years to allow for Arsenal to be, 1 to be a success? I think that we, well, I think Arsenal 1 is going to be a success. The amount of change we've already had in the system, I think, will allow that. I don't think that we actually need radical changes in the system for Anderil to do very well. But for our country to do well, for us to build the national security apparatus we need, we need to move quickly. We need to take targeted risks. We need to get more companies into defense manufacturing. And that includes companies that are not currently defense companies. Getting big tech in, getting little tech in, getting a lot of our industrial providers in. That is how we won World War II, was leveraging the whole of the nation. I think that that's the only way that we are going to, to, to win in the future as well. Uh, and I think that the people who are being brought in are have exactly that mindset. We need to spend less, do more, and do it with the right things. Spend less, do more, and do the right thing. 我觉得唔单止可以套用喺美国嘅军工产业上边，其实套用喺所有嘅政府身上，我觉得今时今日都好合适嘅。因为大家都睇到政府过去几十年，好似个个都变咗一个大花筒。听完 Palmer Lucky 嘅访问，唔知道你哋对 Andrew 嚟紧可能嘅上市计划会唔会非常之期待呢？同埋大家觉得除咗 Palmer Lucky 之外，仲有冇边啲科技人物会能够接到伊朗嘅班呢？